Please settle in now, our service is about to begin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the South Jersey Shore, a welcoming and inclusive faith community. Thank you for joining us. We who bring a teaching of hope, we who bring a saving message, who welcome all in our doors, the joyful, the heartbroken, atheists and Christians, Muslims and Jews, straight and gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, transgender, all who are searching, seeking, looking for more, more meaning, more service, more love. All of us gathered here together. My name is Cynthia Javinsky and I am your worship, worship associate this morning. I'm a member of this congregation and currently serve on a number of committees. I am a member of the choir. I play piano and flute on occasion and a member of the Buddhist Sangha. Our worship service today is led by Deb Dagavarian. <clears throat> Deb has been a member of this congregation for 15 years and has been a Unitarian since she was about 11 years old. She holds a doctor of education degree, has worked in academic administration for about 35 years, and has taught part-time at different colleges for 42 years. She recently retired from teaching. She has published articles in professional journals and has two books on baseball. She is married and has a wonderful son, Nick Bonar, who is also a member. <clears throat> If you are new to our congregation, welcome. We would love to connect with you and help you get to know our congregation better. If you are joining us live on Zoom, please visit the chat area of your screen and click the visitor link to connect with our congregation. If you are hard of hearing, closed captioning of the whole service is available on the YouTube recording that will be posted this afternoon. If you care to tweet during today's service, you can use the hashtag UUCSJS. If you are joining from a computer or smartphone, you are encouraged to type any joys or concerns in the chat box area of your screen. In most platforms, it can be accessed by a chat icon at either the top or bottom of the page. And the chat section will open where you can leave a comment and see what others have said. Please remember that this video will be on the internet, so do not share anything or any information that is best kept private. Welcome to worship. Welcome, you who come in need of healing, you who are confused or have been betrayed. Welcome with your problems and your pain. Welcome to your joys and your wonderings. Welcome your need to hope 
your longing for assurance. Instead of answers, here may you find safety for your questions. Instead of promises, may you find community for your struggles, people with hands and hearts to join you in engaging the challenges, the changes of our day. Our chalice lighting today is an excerpt from Called by Loss, Called by Peace by Heather K. Janulis. And we come this day called by peace. May we hear its song, may we proclaim its promise. May our remembrance today renew our struggle. We can never stay or rest. Please join me in singing along to our gathering hymn for all that is our life. For all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use to build the common good. And make our own days glad. For needs which others serve, for services we give, for work and its rewards, for hours of rest and love, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life. For sorrow we must bear, for failures, pain and loss, for each new thing we learn, for fearful hours that pass, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life. For all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use to build the common good and make our own days glad. During this next musical interlude, we invite you to write your joys and sorrows in the chat portion of your Zoom screen. The icon will either be on the top or bottom of your screen and, you will, and will allow you to enter text into the panel where others can see it. At the end of the musical interlude, I will read what you would share with the congregation gathered here today. Please remember that a recording of today's service will be available on the internet. So as a reminder, please do not share things that ought not be posted for eternity.
Each week we gather in this space with things that weigh upon our hearts and minds. Some bring us joy we wish to share with others and some bring us sorrow that weigh heavy upon our hearts. I will now read what joys and sorrows you would share with this community. Okay, from Chris to Clouser, we are thankful for the Memorial Day Parade tomorrow. Yes, I hope the weather holds out, that would be great. From Yvette, my joy is to be with my parents finally in Mexico, although missing Steve and Tara very much. You can understand that, it's a mixed blessing. Um, from Tracy Catino, I'm grateful for summer approaching. I have been away from home for, <clears throat> excuse me, for work all year, but I will be home all summer long. Wonderful, good news. Um, and Deb says, Deb Dagoberian, Yvette, please give my best to your parents for me. And then Sheila to everyone, I am happy to finally have central air and heat again. Both are very important, yes, <laughs> great. Okay, let us be in the spirit of prayer. We pray for those who are apart from us, whether by distance, time, or conflict unresolved. We pray for those who thirst, whether for water, dignity, or justice. And we pray for our small, blue, fragile planet. Amen. We will now take a moment to give and receive the morning offering. Since we can't pass around a basket over Zoom, we have the next best thing, ways to donate online. In the chat area of your Zoom screen, you will find ways to give over the web, give by text and our, po and our postal address if you'd like to give by check. If you're not joining us live on Zoom, you can visit our website, uucsjs.org and click on the yellow donate button or text or text a donation amount to 609-293-4495. No matter how you support us, we appreciate you and your generous heart. After all, your donation is what keeps us going. Each Unitarian Universalist congregation is self-supporting and 80% of our funds come from you. And no matter how those gifts are offered, they are always most gratefully received. Our reading today is excerpted from an essay by Jackie Robinson, circa 1952. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the beginning of the World Series in 1947, I experienced a completely new emotion when the national anthem was played. This time I thought it's being played for me as much as for anyone else. 
This is organized Major League Baseball. And I am standing here with all the others and everything that takes place includes me. And I thought, what I, what I have always believed has come to be. And what is it that I have always believed? First, that imperfections are human, but that wherever human beings were given room to breathe and time to think, those imperfections would disappear no matter how slowly. I do not believe that we have found or even approached perfection. That is not necessarily in the scheme of human events. Handicaps, stumbling blocks, prejudices, all of these are imperfect, yet they have to be reckoned with because they are in the scheme of human events. Whatever obstacles I found made me fight all the harder, but it would have been impossible for me to fight at all, except that I was sustained by the personal and deep rooted belief that my fight had a chance. It had a chance because it took place in a free society. Not once was I forced to face and fight an immovable object. Not once was a situation so cast iron rigid that I had no chance at all. Free minds and human hearts were at work all around me. And so there was the probability of improvement. I do not believe that every person in every walk of life can succeed in spite of any handicap. That would be perfection. But I do believe, and with every fiber in me, that what I was able to attain came to be because we put behind us, no matter how slowly, the dogmas of the past to discover the truth of today and perhaps find the greatness of tomorrow. I believe in the human race. I believe in the warm heart. I believe in man's integrity. I believe in the goodness of a free society. And I believe that society can remain good only as long as we are willing to fight for it and to fight against whatever imperfections may exist. If someone asked who was the first black man to play in the in Major League Baseball, most people would say Jackie Robinson, right? There were actually others before him in the 19th century. Moses Fleetwood Walker, a catcher who played for several seasons, and his younger brother, brother Weldy Wilberforce Walker. The two brothers played for Toledo of the American Association, which at the time in the 1880s was a major league. Both Fleet and Weldy had attended college, which was very unusual for athletes back in the 19th century, black or white. Although Fleet Walker was reportedly well-liked in Toledo, there was a growing undercurrent of racist sentiment in baseball. Some teams declined to play with the Toledo team when Walker was playing. Opposing team players might try to make a, the black player look bad on the field. Another player refused to sit for a team picture with one of the blacks. Bud Fowler, who never played in the majors, but did play professional baseball, used to cover his shins with wooden slats when he played so that base runners could not cause injury uh, 
could not cause injury by sliding into his spikes, their spikes into him. Management was generally supportive of the black players, but only because they knew team owners would want to put their best players on the field. Then in 1888, a well-known white player who hated blacks made a concerted effort to codify the exclusion of black players from baseball. Adrian Cap Anson was what we would call a white supremacist today. He was a star player and possessed the clout to bar blacks from baseball. Public sentiment was on Anson's side. So from the late 1880s until 1947, no blacks played in major league baseball. There were still black ball players in other leagues, such as the teams in the minor leagues, company teams, town teams, and barnstorming teams. But for a number of reasons, blacks were barred from the major leagues from 1889 to 1947. Just as racism was ripe in the country in general, it showed its ugly face in baseball as well. Many of you have heard of Ty Cobb, the Detroit Tigers hitter who's 367 lifetime batting average, lifetime batting average is the highest in major league history. He was a great ball player, but not such a nice human being. His hatred of blacks was legendary and he was known to run into the stands on occasion to beat up a black player who taunted him. I mean, a black person who taunted him. There were others like the feisty John McGraw, manager of the New York Giants from 1902 to 1932, who periodically tried to slip black players onto his team by claiming that they were Cuban or Native American. He also hired former black players to help his team. For example, he hired Andrew Rube Foster, a crafty black pitcher and founder of the first Negro League to work with his star pitcher, Christy Mathewson. It is believed that Mathewson's signature pitch, the fadeaway, was developed from techniques he learned from Rube Foster. Throughout the 19th, late 19th century and into the 20th, talented black players could play in organized baseball on all black teams. Before 1888, they could play on integrated teams as well. When Rube Foster's pitching days were over, he made a deal to field an all black team that would play its home games in Comiskey Park, where the Major League White Sox played. Rube Foster became a manager and owner of the Chicago American Giant, Giants, a black team. And in 1920, he formed the Negro National League with other owners of Midwestern black teams. After that, Negro Leagues were formed in the East and South among other black teams. So if a talented black athlete wanted to play competitively and was good enough, he could play on one of the teams in the Negro Leagues. Many of these Negro Leaguers, Negro League players never got to play in the majors. Some of the stars were too old by the time the majors were integrated. I was fortunate to have met, met some of these Negro Leaguers at Sabre conventions, that's Society for American Baseball Research. <clears throat> um, I've met them at, uh, in, at uh, Sabre conventions in different cities in the country. In fact, I spent a pleasant afternoon in Chicago in 1986 chatting with one of the stars of the Negro Leagues, Ted Double Duty Radcliffe, who was 84 at the time. Damon Runyon gave Radcliffe his nickname because he'd catch one day and pitch the next. 
Radcliffe lived to be 103. So what happened to integrate America's national pastime? <clears throat> Excuse me just a minute. Longtime baseball commissioner, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was not a proponent of blacks in the major leagues, died in 1944. The next commissioner of Major League Baseball was Happy Chandler, who was a U.S. Senator and Democratic Governor of Kentucky. He was a breath of fresh air after the long authoritarian tenure of Landis. Landis. <clears throat> Branch Rickey, who was the new general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, wanted very much to bring a black player to the team. His motivation was his memory of a black player on the college team he coached years earlier, whom he'd see being turned away at the team's hotels and restaurants. This inequitable treatment made an impression on Branch Rickey, a deeply religious man. So he was determined to bring the first black player to the majors. He decided on Jack Robinson, who was college educated, intelligent, and a superb athlete. Jackie made his major league debut on April 15, 1947. Many of you know that he drove that Brooklyn team to win the National League Championship. Though the, the Dodgers made it to the World Series, they were beaten by the Yankees in the World Series. Now, I don't mean to imply that Major League Baseball was a pioneering progressive force. It wasn't then and never has been. But bringing a black man to the majors at a time when Jim Crow laws flourished was taking a big chance. And Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson took that chance and prevailed. Each man played a role in this social experiment and their mutual respect kept them going against enormous odds. And Jack Robinson was the perfect man to carry this mantle. Many of you also know that Jackie Robinson's early years in the majors were filled with numerous death threats and a barrage of taunts from people in the stands and on opposing teams. Three months after Jack Robinson was signed by Brooklyn, the Cleveland Indians signed Larry Doby and a third player was signed to the St. Louis Browns. Integration was slow to take hold. The last team to integrate didn't do so until 1959, a full 12 years after Jackie Robinson was signed by the Dodgers. And what about black managers in Major League Baseball? The first one was hired in 1975 for Cleveland, Frank Robinson, no relation to Jackie. Throughout Major League Baseball history, there have, only, there have been only 16 black managers. Two of those are current managers, Dave Roberts of the LA Dodgers and Dusty Baker of the Houston Astros. Jackie Robinson came up to the majors in 1947. The 1950s saw federal legislation to end segregation in the military and in public schools. In 1957, President Eisenhower signed the first piece of substantial civil rights legislation to protect voting rights. That was actually the first in the 20th century. Throughout the 60s, a series of civil rights acts were passed to prevent discrimination in employment, to assure fairness in housing, and to guarantee voting rights. What did these legislative acts accomplish? They changed overt behavior so that the legal rights of Black people were protected. But what does this really mean? 
We know that legislation for civil rights is a good thing, but how much does it actually change people's opinions? Not much. Last summer, when George Floyd was callously murdered by a cop, the Black Lives Matter movement gained tremendous public sympathy from Americans. Unfortunately, that sentiment didn't last. And as more time has passed, we've continued to separate into our polarized positions along partisan lines. States led by Republicans are already rolling back the advances we made decades ago. And what of baseball? As much as I personally want the sport I love to stand for progressive change, it's not there yet and probably never will be. Though I was very gratified when Major League Baseball took a stand against the state of Georgia's restrictive and regressive new voting laws by boycotting the state for this year's All-Star Game, I don't expect, expect that single act to put Major League Baseball at the forefront of social justice. Instead of moving forward, we seem to be going backwards today. Social justice is being crushed under the weight of systemic racism. Lawmakers care more about their own desires than about a healthy democracy. We need the arc of the moral universe to bend further towards true justice. May it be so, amen. Thank you, Deb. That was really good. Uh, it was so enlightening to hear about the struggles of the Negro League and what we're still going through today. The struggle is ongoing and uh, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. So anyway, thank you again. It's very good. Our closing words are from Reverend Sherry Woodbury. To speak, listen, listen to and care for our stories. May we have the courage to speak or write the stories within us that need to be told, the stories that make up our lives. May we listen with a loving mind and heart to the stories of others' lives, others here in this church and others in our wider community and world. Let us choose with care the stories that we teach to our children, remembering that all of our stories have power and that all of our stories are connected for all of life is one. In the name of all that is sacred in these gathered hearts, may it be so. Amen. Let's read the words together for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. There is always a light when we are ready to see it. There is always a light when we are ready to be it. 
To see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. Share is always your light. light in the dark. We are ready to see this. Share is always your light. light in the dark. We are ready to be it. To see the light, to be light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night and be a gift. Together we will. There is always share is always your light. There is always the dark. We are ready to see it. There is always share is always. There is always in the dark. Light. We are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to shine the eyes in the dark of night, and be a kindness to you. We will. We will. There is always light. There is always dark. We have uh, some announcements this morning. Thinking of attending you, uh, this year's UU Gathering General Assembly online, UUC SJS is in need of delegates. Delegates attend GA business meetings to represent our congregation and vote on important matters, such as updated UUA bylaws, the proposed statement of conscience, and the election of UUA leadership positions. Visit uua.org GA for more information. Contact Kit Marlowe if you're interested in representing our congregation. Planning has begun for the reopening of our building. Look in your midweek message for more information on how you can help out. Reverend Dawn is currently on medical leave. If you are in need of assistance, please contact Tracy Catino, Helen Utz, Denise O'Meara, or Mary Lou De Maria Barang. Our children's religious education program, RE on TV, has come to an end. Miss Jess will be back next week to host a children's snack time for families following coffee hour. Please take the opportunity to keep virtually connected. And so events for this week, we have heartfulness meditation on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday, Margaret Circle Thursday, Buddhist Sangha this Friday, Parents and caregivers, the sexuality educators on Friday as well, and the UUC SJS annual meeting, most important this Sunday. If you need to schedule a meeting or event, please reach out to the admin at UUC SJS admin at gmail.com for use of the Zoom room or to be added to the calendar. We warmly welcome all of you who are visiting us today please click on the visitor link in the chat area to connect with our congregation. We invite all of you here today to stay and socialize in our online social time so that we can get to know each other better. Now let us share in a moment of silent reflection to consider today's message and the meaning it has in our lives. <laughs> 